Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. Today we're doing Epic History TV's World War I 1918. This is the last part of their World War I series. Let's get into it. <laughs> Nineteen eighteen. After three and a half years of war, the Allies are in crisis. Russia has been rocked by revolution, and its new Bolshevik government has signed an armistice with the Central Powers. Thousands of German troops will be freed up to fight on the Western Front, where the carnage of trench warfare has already claimed more than a million lives. But Germany is also desperate. Britain's long naval blockade has led to shortages and social unrest at home. While America's entry into the war brings fresh manpower and vast resources to the Allied cause, Germany faces inevitable defeat unless it can win a quick victory on the Western Front. US President Wilson announces his 14 points. They outline his vision for a post-war world, including an end to secret treaties, a reduction in the size of armed forces, self-determination for the people of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and an international organization to settle future disputes. But most European leaders dismiss his ideas as wishful thinking. At Brest-Litovsk, Bolshevik Russia signs a peace treaty with the Central Powers. Russia gives up vast amounts of territory in exchange for peace. So, a couple of things. One, as much as I hate Woodrow Wilson, I will give him a little bit of credit here. He was pushing not just at this point of the war when the U.S. gets into it, but he's been pushing for a while at this point, that whenever the war ends, it needs to leave the world into a situation where something like this is not going to happen again. So you have uh, the No More Secret Treaties, and you have the, uh, uh, the, the creation of the League of Nations, which sucks, but eventually will become the UN. Um, you have things like that, but also he has been pushing the Germans and the British specifically, but both sides of the war, to essentially come to a negotiated peace that isn't going to directly set the world up for another major conflict. And his argument for this is, if a peace is imposed because one side has total victory and another side total defeat, if a peace is imposed that is harsh to the point of extreme hatred and bitterness, then he argues that another war is all but certain because there's already going to be hatred and bitterness just from the war itself, just from the loss of lives. And so he's saying, y'all are going to have to work really hard to come to some sort of negotiation that doesn't exacerbate this drastically. Obviously, with the Treaty of Versailles, that was not the direction that the Entente decided to go with this. But it's one of the things that Wilson has been arguing for a while up to this point. And the, the Russian side of this, they had the no war, no peace idea. Trotsky, who I think was a, a brilliant mind, there are a lot of things that he did not understand very well. He was a very good organizer. There were things that he understood very well. But the idea that you could just stop fighting and then the Germans would just like leave you alone is wild to me like what in the world would make you think that if you your guys stop shooting at the germans that they just went up and leave that's that's crazy but that was the idea 
Um, and they end up having to give even more territory after that fails. So uh, this is the treaty signed between the Germans and the Russians is historically uh, looked at as one of the harshest, most one-sided treaties ever. Um, it certainly does not do the Germans any favors whenever they ultimately lose and then go to negotiate for the Treaty of Versailles. Half a million German troops can now be redeployed from the east to the Western Front, where German General Erich Ludendorff plans an all-out, last-ditch offensive to win the war. Ludendorff's spring offensive catches the Allies off guard. German stormtroopers, using new infiltration tactics, help to overwhelm the British Fifth Army, which is soon in full retreat. The German advance threatens to split the British and French armies, with disastrous consequences. So French General Ferdinand Foch is appointed supreme commander of Allied forces to coordinate strategy. Outside Amiens, British and Australian troops improvise a defence and finally halt the German advance. The German offensive switches to the north, targeting the channel ports. But the British inflict heavy losses on the Germans and prevent a breakthrough. Above the trenches, the first air war continues to escalate. Each side now has more than 3,000 aircraft in service on the Western Front. If you look at what airplanes were at the beginning of this war, they look like what the Wright brothers created initially. I mean, they are the most rudimentary, crazy that they even flew type of aircraft ever. By the end of the war, everybody is putting way more money into it. They understand that it is strategically important, not just for reconnaissance, but if you can control the air, you have a huge advantage on the ground. And so planes start to look much more like planes will look going forward and into World War II than they did at the beginning of this war. But by 1918, the Allies have won air superiority, thanks to greater resources. On the 21st of April, Germany's most famous pilot, Manfred von Richthofen, the Red Baron, is shot down and killed near Amiens. With 80 victories, he's the war's highest scoring ace, and is buried by the Allies with full military honours. Britain's new independent bombing force launches a daylight raid against Cologne. It marks the beginning of Britain's own strategic bombing campaign. On the ground, Ludendorff's offensive switches south, targeting the French. German troops advance 30 miles, but are halted at the River Marne, just as fresh American divisions enter the line. The US 1st Division is the first to see combat at the Battle of Cantigny. Three days later, the US 2nd Division wins victory at the Battle of Belleau Wood. By now, there are nearly a million American soldiers in France, with 10,000 more arriving every day. The fourth phase of the German offensive leads to a nine-mile advance but is finally halted by a French counterattack. In Italy, Austria-Hungary launches an attack at Asiago and the Piave River to support Ludendorff's offensive in France. But it's repulsed with heavy losses and morale amongst the Austro-Hungarian army collapses. British and French troops land at Murmansk in northern Russia. It's the beginning of Allied intervention in Russia's civil war, on the side of so-called white or anti-Bolshevik forces. 
On the Western Front, the Germans' final attack is defeated in the Second Battle of the Marne. Ludendorff's offensive has cost the Germans more than 600,000 casualties and has failed to make a decisive breakthrough. Germany's final gamble has failed. The Allies now go on the attack. At the Battle of Amiens, British, Australian, Canadian and French troops, supported by tanks and aircraft, advanced seven miles in a single day. General Ludendorff calls the 8th of August the Black Day of the German Army. German troops are exhausted, hungry and demoralised, and begin to surrender in their thousands. The Battle of Amiens begins the Allies' Hundred Days Offensive. Trench warfare is over. The Germans are in full retreat. In the Balkans, a new Allied offensive at Dobropolje breaks through Bulgarian positions. The overstretched Bulgarian army collapses, and two weeks later, Bulgaria signs an armistice. In the Middle East, British-led forces defeat the Turks at the Battle of Megiddo, taking 25,000 prisoners. Allied troops soon occupy Damascus, and Aleppo. And think about what this means for the Austro-Hungarian and Ottoman empires. They were dying empires considered the sick man of Europe uh, before the war started. Um, you know, the, the Germans had this saying, um, oh, the Germans had a saying that they were, they were uh, fighting uh, fettered to a corpse, that they were trying to fight a war while being tied to a dead guy. Um, when talking about the Austro-Hungarian Empire, um, this is the end for them, and they know it. They they know it. They know that the way that the Entente and the U.S. sees them is like, if we lose, the empire is over, and so. Things, when, once things start to collapse, they start to collapse very, very quickly in those two places. And with the Germans, they also collapse quickly, but they're having huge social issues right now. Um, oh, the, the last winter they had was called the, the parsnip winter because that's all that they really had to eat. Um, so nobody has food, nobody has any sort of supplies or anything. It's all been siphoned and sent to the army. And as this war has dragged on, it has made the army need more and more resources from the general economy to the point that there is nothing left for the regular people. Um, that along with the, the British blockade, which at this point, they were the British were like a snake with their navy. They implemented the blockade at the beginning of the war, which there are a lot of people at the be beginning of the war, um, including French high command, who believes that is the dumbest idea ever. They're like this war isn't going to last nearly long enough for a blockade to have any impact. That's the stupidest idea ever. It is you are much better off using those naval resources to do something, anything else other than that. But as the war goes on year by year, that blockade becomes a snake that is coiling tighter and tighter and tighter around the German economy. And by 1918, they are strangling the German economy. And so, yeah, it's everybody is in a very, very tough position. And all three of, of these countries, uh, the Ottoman Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the German Empire, are all going to fall. Now, Germany will still exist, but it will not exist under the same government. The Kaiser is going to have to get the hell out of Dodge. Both of the other empires collapse, and so this is not only the loss of a war for them, this is a loss of an empire. 
On the Western Front, Marshal Foch orders a general attack. British, French and American armies reach the Hindenburg Line, a line of reinforced German defences, and break through. Ludendorff informs the Kaiser that the military situation is hopeless and that Germany must seek an armistice. Germany sends a request to US President Woodrow Wilson, who in return demands German withdrawal from all occupied territory and the Kaiser's abdication. On the Italian front, the Allies deliver the final blow to Austria-Hungary at the Battle of Vittorio Veneto. The Austro-Hungarian army disintegrates and 300,000 prisoners are taken. With the Central Powers facing collapse, the Ottoman Empire signs an armistice with the Allies at Mudros. Four days later, Austria-Hungary signs an armistice with the Allies at Villa Giusti. At Kiel, the German High Seas Fleet is ordered to make a suicidal attack on the British Navy. But instead, it mutinies. Revolution spreads through Germany. The Kaiser abdicates. And a German Republic is proclaimed. On the 11th of November 1918, a German delegation signs an armistice with the Allies inside Marshal Foch's railway carriage at Compiègne. It comes into force at 11am, but fighting continues until the last moment. American Private Henry Gunter is killed, charging a German machine gun at 10.59. He is thought to be the last soldier killed during World War I. Hitler is going to be, bring back that train car for World War II. You can tell how petty he was about Three it. Three days later, in East Africa, German General von Lettow Vorbeck surrenders his army on the Chambezi River. For four years, he has tied down huge numbers of Allied troops, remaining undefeated while cut off from home he is still considered one of history's greatest guerrilla leaders. The Paris Peace Conference opens at the Palace of Versailles, just outside the French capital. Delegates accept a proposal to create a League of Nations to settle future international disputes. The Versailles Treaty, signed in June, imposes harsh terms on Germany. Its military is restricted in size. It must pay war reparations to the Allies. It loses territory to its neighbours. And its colonies are seized by the victors. Germany must also accept responsibility for the war in a war guilt clause, a source of lasting resentment in Germany. The boundaries of Europe are redrawn. Poland re-emerges after a hundred years of foreign rule, while Austria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, and an enlarged Romania emerged from the ashes of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Czechoslovakia is about to go through a really turbulent time in their own history right here. Um, I will say about the Treaty of Versailles, I had a conversation in, in one of the comments of a previous video about the Treaty of Versailles and its effects on World War II. My position on this and I've, I have heard arguments from every direction on this and from people that know way, way more about this than I do. Um, so there are a lot of different positions that people take um, and a lot of them are really brilliant people that have a lot of evidence to support their arguments. My belief is 
like a lot of people in this time period, believed that because of the way World War I happened and because of the Treaty of Versailles and the harshness of it, that there was going to be a second major war. <laughs> now, that does not necessarily mean that it started World War II because Hitler, as the kind of historical arsonist that he is, comes in and sets fire to all of Europe in a way that nobody was really predicting. However, my thought process is that's World War II is going to happen at some point, whether Hitler's there, whether Hitler died in World War I, everything is set up from uh, Germany having to accept fault for the war, to have to pay back reparations, to the U.S. leveraging its economy to try to keep some semblance of stability in the German economy. Um, there are just so many things about the way that specifically World War I happened and then the way that it ended in the Treaty of Versailles that I think that it was, if not 100% certain, it was, it was pushing towards another world war in a way that it didn't necessarily have to. The Ottoman Empire is dismantled. New states, most under European control, are created in the Middle East. Here, as in Europe, the seeds of future conflict are sown. While in the Far East, former German possessions in China are handed to Japan, to China's outrage. World War I claimed the lives of nine and a half million soldiers. One in eight of those who fought. 21 million more were wounded. Seven million civilians also lost their lives. Huge areas of Europe were left devastated. Yeah, there are parts of Europe that are still devastated to this day. Um, when you look, it's very easy. Uh, Joseph Stalin has a quote that is one of the most interesting historical quotes ever to me. And it is that uh, one death is a tragedy, uh, a million a statistic. Um, that is the way that World War I is really easy to get sucked into. Because you see 200,000 dead here. Uh, 150,000 dead here, 600,000 dead in, in another spot. Even just on the Eastern Front, for the, the casualties for the Austro-Hungarians and Germany and Russia are so astronomical that it really is hard to compute in your head. And you start to get kind of bogged down and it becomes sort of monotonous after a while. However, when you read... Uh, first-hand accounts from the war, it gives you far more perspective on what this was like for everybody on the ground. You know, there were generals even late in the war that were, you know, 10, 20 miles behind the line. They were in relative safety. They had fires going. They were looking at maps and had protractors and and that's the way that I see myself studying this conflict and, and other conflicts like it um, a lot from this kind of outside, uh, almost like non-empathetic mathematical viewpoint. Um, and it's very easy to look at it from that top-down 10,000-foot view. Um, however... I would encourage everybody to read a couple of the short first-hand accounts of a specific battle or a specific shelling. And when you read how individual people handled it or what individual people went through, then it's very easy to extrapolate that and say like, oh my God, this is one of the most gruesome stories I've ever read ever. And there were 9 million other stories like this. It, it's just, it's so brutal 
but it's so easy to look at it in a way that just totally bypasses the humanity of the whole conflict or the lack of humanity of the whole conflict. So. Old empires vanished. New states were born. Lives across the world were transformed. The world was never the same again. If you All right, that was the last episode of Epic History TV's World War I series. Like, comment, subscribe. I'm going to jump right into the Napoleon series next, probably in about an hour or two. So that will be up soon, and uh, I'll see you guys then.